On October 2, 2018, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi entered the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. It would be the last time he was seen alive. Müziği sever, sanatı severdi. Roman üzerine konuşurdu konumla. Ee, hakikaten çok latif bir insandı. Nasıl hala bu yapıldı işte e, soru orada. İnsanların aklı almıyor burada. Ya bunu hak edecek ne yaptı? We turn now to the disappearance raising alarms around the world. A Saudi journalist, a Washington Post contributor. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince told Bloomberg he has no idea what happened to Khashoggi. The Central Intelligence Agency has already told the president who they think is accountable. They believe that Mohammed bin Salman likely ordered the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. They have nothing definitive. And the fact is, maybe he did, Maybe he did. Ignoring the findings of America's intelligence services and coming to a conclusion that is totally unsupported by the facts makes no sense. It's a big mistake. The Trump administration has got this wrong. We have a very important guest with us, Jamal Khashoggi, the very prominent um, Saudi journalist. Welcome, Mr. Jamal. How are you? Ahlan wa Thank you for having me here. Jamal had a long and varied career in Saudi Arabia, and, and a lot of that time was spent quite close to the ruling circles. And in fact, the, you know, the only time I ever spoke to him was when I was calling to get some sort of a government comment. So he had this dual role of journalist and consummate insider and occasional spokesperson for the government. Something happened to, to Jamal. The dream that he had that the Arab, Arab world would be purified, initially he thought by this Muslim revolution, it became a, an idea that it was really the openness, the, the, the, the values that he had as a journalist of telling the truth, of holding the leaders of these countries responsible. That became his, his, his real passion. <laughs> Khashoggi believed the idealism of the 2011 Arab Spring uprisings and the upheaval they caused would lead to reforms taking hold in the region, including in Saudi Arabia. But the kingdom resisted the upheaval, and in 2015, Mohammed bin Salman, the young and ambitious prince, began accumulating power. Two years later, when he was named Crown Prince, the heir to the throne of his father, King Salman, Mohammed's authority as Saudi Arabia's unchallenged ruler was all but assured. And it's after MBS comes to power that Khashoggi starts becoming a more outspoken critic of his policies. By this time, he's no longer in the government, and he's someone who is being, on the one hand, critical, but at the same time, you know, not defamatory. Remarkable times in Saudi Arabia, the hugely influential Sunni Muslim kingdom. There's been an unprecedented anti-corruption purge. High following the weekend arrest of dozens of Saudi Arabian princes and high-ranking officials. It's also begun arresting women's rights campaigners. All of this was part of uh, this unusually aggressive consolidation of power by the crown prince. And then part of that consolidation has meant making sure he has no rivals and that he has no critics either inside the kingdom or outside the kingdom. I just give a very quick answer to your question. Saudi Arabia is a 100 years old monarchy. They are afraid of change, whether the change coming from democracy or from revolution of, of, of any sort. Another divide with the royal family occurred after the 2016 election of Donald Trump. The kingdom welcomed the Republican president's hardline stance toward Iran, but Khashoggi was critical. He warned that Trump's anti-Muslim rhetoric and apparent support of Russian President Vladimir Putin was a threat to Saudi interests. Increasingly isolated, threatened, and vilified, Khashoggi went into exile near Washington, D.C. in June 2017. But it's harder to leave Saudi Arabia than it appears. One of the first 
signals of that comes just a few months after his arrival in the United States. Khashoggi is getting calls actually from Saudi officials who are connected to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. One individual in particular is a man named Saud al Qatani. He's this very close ally of the Crown Prince. Some people have described him even as a kind of Rasputin figure. And in at least one of those conversations we know of, Saud al Qatani is actually trying to get Jamal to come back to Saudi Arabia. Khashoggi tells one of his friends, essentially, I'm not crazy, there's no way I'm doing that. In September 2017, Khashoggi became a contributing columnist for the Washington Post. So when I met him, I actually didn't know at the time that he was already in the U.S. That first piece that he wrote um, in September was effectively his sort of coming out piece to the world uh, in which he was extremely honest about what was happening to his associates and, and colleagues. So I think I, I found him at a time when he was ready to be bold. He praised a lot of MBS's reforms. He thought it was great that women could drive. He thought it was great that the religious establishment in Saudi Arabia had been cut back. But he wouldn't stop himself, just because he supported some of the reforms, from saying, this leadership is autocratic. It's behaving in a ruthless way. It doesn't have respect for human rights. I see him as a reformer, but he is gathering all power within his hand. And it would be much better for him to allow a breathing space for critic, for uh, Saudi intellectuals, Saudi writers, Saudi media to debate. Long-time dissidents for the royal family may have been, you know, sort of easier to dismiss. Clearly, they were uncomfortable with his role as a foreign-based critic of their policies with an especially loud platform at the Washington Post. Khashoggi knew his writings and his connections came with risks. Perhaps most problematic for Khashoggi were his links to an organization funded by Qatar, Saudi Arabia's regional rival. The Post would later discover an executive at Qatar Foundation International had at times helped Khashoggi shape his columns. It is not clear if the Saudi government was aware of Khashoggi's new connections in Washington. In the end, Khashoggi underestimated what Saudi Arabia was capable of. Şimdi şöyle Cemal Eylül başı beni aradı. Turan dedi sana bir şey söyleyeceğim. Buyur dedim ve üstad dedim. Ya dedi ben Türkiye'li Türkiye'den evleneceğim dedi. Öyle bir düşüncem var. Kim dedim peki dedim. Ya dedi bir kız var dedi. Adı Hatice dedi. Sen de kız biliyorsun kız ben dedi. Evet dedim. Doğru mu dedim? Evet dedi. Peki ne düşünüyorsun dedi. Ya dedi babasına sen gider benim adıma ister misin dedi. Eğer kız istiyorsa ben haydi haydi giderim dedi. Benim için bir sıkıntı yok dedi. He goes over to Turkey uh, and he is there to marry his fiance. He needs to obtain paperwork from the Saudi government in order to complete that marriage. So on that fateful day when he walks in, he goes in on the one hand believing that he's there to obtain these documents, but at the same time understanding because of what's happened in the weeks and months before that the Saudi government is paying very close attention to him. And I think it's fair to say based on what he tells his friends, he doesn't feel that the Saudi government has his best interest at heart. We're going to move on now. Chilling new developments in the disappearance of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal Khashoggi. After Khashoggi failed to emerge from the consulate, his fiance called a close advisor to Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. When he, he gave uh, my name to his, to his fiance that if in any case uh, taking place wrong, uh, he, she should uh, call me. And indeed, when she called me, it was too late. Tuesday, Tuesday, October 2nd, my email and my WhatsApp started blowing up. People asking, have you seen the news? Have you, have you heard this? Efendim, bir anlaşım var dedi. Burada herkes çıktı dedi. Herkes gitti, mesai dağıldı. Burada beklemin hiçbir anlamı yok dedi. Ve ben ona şunu sordum. Dedim ki, Cemal Bey az önce buradan içeri girdi. Bir, iki saat önce içeriye girdi. Ve ben onu burada bekliyorum. Geçen sefer de burada bekliyordum. Ve telefonları bende çıkmış olsaydı mutlaka yanıma gelirdi. Hayır dedim, çıkmadı. Ben biliyorum çıkmadı, buradan çıkmadı. Çok büyük bir şey kaybetmiş gibi hissettim o anda yani. Aradan saatler geçti. Konsolosluk haber vermiyor, büyük elçi haber vermiyor. And at that point we thought, 
well, maybe this is some type of a detention or maybe even some rendition where they would catch him and they would take him back to Saudi Arabia. So we thought we had to move very quickly. We reached out immediately to the White House and they immediately reached out to their Saudi counterpart and made inquiries and, and even transmitted a letter that I'd sent to the Crown Prince to make sure that it reached him. He never responded. I had subsequent conversations with the Vice President, uh, Secretary of State, others at the State Department and at the White House. And in each case, we express the urgency in moving on this. Aradan 3-4 gün geçti. Fakat bize gelen bütün haberler hep olumsuz. Arap dünyasından. Cemal'le Cemal'le biz 15 yıldır tanışıyoruz. Hakikaten ciddi bir üzüntü yaşadım. Saudi Arabia's response after Jamal disappeared was to say that they had no idea what had happened to him that he had walked out of the consulate, that they didn't know where he went after that, and that they were, in fact, worried about him. The White House was very reluctant to talk about it, but uh, essentially said, well, we're going to talk to the Saudis and we're going to figure out what's going on here. Within days, Turkish officials were insisting that Khashoggi had been brutally murdered, undermining Saudi assertions that Khashoggi had, as far as they knew, left the consulate unharmed. October the 6th word came out of Istanbul that he'd been killed. And the reports were that planes had been sent from Saudi Arabia with crews, including a physician, that were waiting for him. We immediately demanded to talk to the Saudi ambassador. And he agreed to meet. In fact, he came to my house in Georgetown. Uh, he offered a series ex of explanations. He said that Jamal left the consulate within 30 minutes. I said, well, can you show us the video? Show us the video that's time stamped that shows him exiting. Because we have video show him going in. And he said, well, our, our system was broken, so we have no way to retrieve it. It turned out that every single thing that I had been told by the Saudi ambassador was false. On October 11th, the Washington Post reported that Turkey had told U.S. officials it had audio recordings from inside the consulate, proving Khashoggi had been killed. When Khashoggi returns to the consulate, you know, he, he approaches the consulate, he asks his fiancée to stay outside, gives her a number to call if there's any problem, goes inside, and according to people who have heard or read the transcript. He's greeted kind of warmly initially. He is even um, asked if he wants some tea, but he's already sensing something is wrong in, inside. His response is basically, yeah, I'll take some tea, but there's an edge to it that suggests he knows that this is more than just a, a routine kind of nicety. This is a team of of operatives from Saudi Arabia that come with a syringe loaded with enough sedative to be lethal. There's a struggle. Uh, he maybe tries to resist and, and you hear him struggling, trying to hold on to life, hold on to breath, uh, and then that struggle ends. So what happens next in the consulate is it just goes quiet and it sounds like there is some regrouping going on among this team the commotion starts again. Then there is a sound of some sort of electronic device, a saw, something. Something is happening that suggests that they are trying to find a way to dispose of Jamal's body. There is this excruciating noise. It's unclear what happens next. It's some, you know, what happens to Jamal's body is one of the, one of the lingering mysteries here. Saudi Arabia has maintained throughout that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman had nothing to do with the murder. At first, the kingdom claimed Khashoggi was killed, but in an accident. Khashoggi's 
أدت إلى حدوث شجار واشتباك بالأيدي مع المواطن جمال خاشقجي مما أدى إلى وفاته رحمه الله The kingdom changed its story at least two more times. It acknowledged that its agents had killed Khashoggi in a premeditated operation. Then it said that its agents had been ordered to bring Khashoggi back to Saudi Arabia alive, but ended up killing him. Lütfen hakikati ortaya çıkarmamıza, failleri ve onların siyasal planlayıcılarını adalet karşısına çıkarabilmemize yardımcı olun. So when Trump appears early on in a, in a I mean, sort of press conference on the White House grounds, the king firmly denied any knowledge of it. He didn't really know. Maybe I, I don't want to get into his mind, but it sounded to me like maybe these could have been rogue killers. Who knows? I mean, that's, that's the exact idea that the Crown Prince is trying to advance from Riyadh. He is doing the Crown Prince's kind of propaganda or talking points for him in that moment. If they knew about it, that would be bad. If they didn't know about it, things, bad things can happen. So right after Khashoggi's death, I mean, I think you start to see a split, a fissure in the U.S. government. So for, for U.S. intelligence agencies, their job in a situation like this is to try to figure out as best they can what happened. And one of the things, first things that is found is that there is this historic uh, record of communications being intercepted, suggesting that the Saudis were trying to lure Khashoggi back. But this is sort of information that is coming in as part of this glut of signals and phone calls and emails that the United States intelligence services intercept every single day. So nobody really sees this until after it's too late. And also there is this audio recording now from inside the consulate that firmly helps lay the blame. The CIA director, Gina Haspel, goes to Turkey to meet with uh, Turkish intelligence officials and to be able to hear this tape and probably return with a copy of it. And it's not just the actual sort of physical evidence or the electronic evidence, if you will. It's also that the CIA pays very close attention to how Mohammed bin Salman operates, the level of control he has over the government. They simply cannot possibly believe these CIA intelligence analysts that this operation would have been rogue. And what I'm told is when the CIA presents this initial assessment to U.S. officials, they are in fact struck by how confident the CIA is that Mohammed bin Salman was the one who was to blame for this. You know, for the Trump administration, Saudi Arabia is the linchpin to their Middle East strategy, right? It is a strategy that's focused on hurting Iran. For Trump, I mean, he sees Saudi Arabia as this rich kingdom that he can hopefully get some money from. Saudi Arabia is our partner. They're our ally. I do think this, that I worked very hard to get the order for the military. It's $110 billion. It's a very simple equation for me. I'm about make America great again, and I'm about America first. President Trump's relationship with the Saudis actually predates his time uh, in office, and well before he ran for president. He talked on the campaign trail about having great relationships with Saudis. Saudi Arabia, and I get along great with all of them. They buy apartments from me, they spend 40 million, 50 million. Am I supposed to dislike them? I like them very much. When he comes into the White House, he is pushed, particularly by Jared Kushner, his son-in-law and senior advisor, to make Saudi Arabia his first foreign trip, which is very unusual. But all throughout that trip, there are these meetings between Jared Kushner and Mohammed bin Salman, and that relationship really is the one that is kind of what underpins right now U.S.-Saudi relationships. So there is a call that Jared has with Mohammed bin Salman after Khashoggi has, has gone missing and is, and is believed to be dead, in which essentially the Crown Prince says, I had nothing to do with it. And it's important because it establishes this very firm, high level on the record denial. First of all, the uh, crime was uh, really painful to all Saudis. Uh, and I believe it is uh, painful to every human in the world. It is a heinous uh, crime that cannot be justified. So it really means now that MBS is looking for the White House to back him up. And that's precisely what the White House ultimately does, is they back Saudi Arabia's version of events, and they essentially have not deviated from that. In November, the CIA concluded, with medium to high confidence, that Mohammed ordered the assassination. 
but President Trump seemed reluctant to accept the findings. Well, the CIA, Mr. President, concluded with confidence that... They didn't conclude. No, no, Josh, they didn't conclude. I'm sorry. Do you, they, do you, wait, do you wait. think they did not? Josh, no, they didn't conclude. They did not come to a conclusion. Uh, they have feelings certain ways, but they didn't I have the report. What were and you can, ask, you can ask, Mike, they have not concluded. Nobody's concluded. I don't know if anyone's going to be able to conclude that the crown prince did it. But He's looking for proof that almost never comes in a case like this. He's sort of trying to hold the U.S. intelligence agencies to a near impossible standard and use that to cast doubt on the work that they're doing. And that's, that's devastating to people at the CIA, to analysts. Their primary mission is to bring the best possible information they can to the President of the United States. So while Trump is saying maybe he did, maybe he didn't, and dismissing the intelligence community's findings here, the CIA is sending its director straight to the Hill and sharing that same intelligence, those same conclusions with lawmakers there. Where you're standing right now okay. last week and said he had seen no direct right. evidence of the prince's involvement. Uh, I think today, uh, Secretary Pompeo and Mattis are following the lead of the president. Uh, there's not a smoking gun, there's a smoking saw. I have zero question in my mind that the uh, Crown Prince, MBS, ordered the killing. If he was in front of a jury, he would be convicted in 30 minutes. Uh, on November 15th, the Treasury Department announced sanctions on 17 individuals linked to Khashoggi's death. Among them was Saud al Qatani, the close ally to the Crown Prince. That same day, Saudi Arabia brought charges against 11 individuals, but it has refused to publicly name the defendants and say whether senior officials are among those indicted. Can you say anything? Investigation. On November 20th, a bipartisan group of U.S. senators invoked the Global Magnitsky Act. It required the Trump administration to determine within 120 days whether the crown prince was responsible for Khashoggi's death. The Trump administration missed the deadline and instead issued a statement declining to submit a report. In December, senators passed a resolution blaming Mohammed for Khashoggi's death. Joint resolution is passed. Unanimously, the United States Senate has said that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. I would much rather to see uh, some form of uh, democracy, some form of uh, uh, accountability. It is an important transformation that requires all of us to contribute to it, to discuss it, and no one should be jailed. We have to seek democracy. And most of the wars we are having today in the Middle East is because of our inability to agree on a leader. Democracy is the solution. It's disheartening to, to think that that a voice like his that is so prominent and so important can just be tossed away like that in a consulate. If they thought he was a headache while he was alive, now that he's dead, they've made him a martyr. Today we announced an important new Washington Post initiative called the Press Freedom Partnership, using the reach of Washington Post platforms to champion the journalists who risk every day to expose the truth. We can keep alive the noble work of Jamal Khashoggi. Well, incidents like this, just shock all of us. And it reminds us how dangerous the mission is that our journalists are pursuing. And if they are harmed, we will demand the truth and we will demand accountability from those who do that. Jamal, may God have mercy on him, had committed himself to defend the opinion, uh, the opinion leaders of the country, of his country. So this is the death of a single individual at some level. And so it's this tiny kind of Thing in, a, in a huge global constellation of bad things that happen all the time. But the significance of this really stands out in, in um, disturbing ways. It's part, in part, it's because when an, when an American president um, has the impulse to downplay the murder of somebody who's trying to argue for freedom, democratic reforms, uh, human rights in a place like the Middle East that has been deprived of this for decades and decades. It's a dark time for people who are fighting that fight.